Hey T heads, this weekend we celebrated Chinese New Year, so I haven't had an opportunity to do a tea video. However, yesterday we celebrated at the Mayleaf Tea House and I gave a speech about consciousness. I've had quite a few requests asking for me to put that speech up online, so this is a speech all about consciousness. It's got nothing to do with tea, so if you're not interested in those sort of philosophical discussions, then you'll have to wait for another video, but we've got about 200 videos for you to check out, so you've got plenty to keep you entertained. Don't worry, normal services will resume next weekend and we'll be back on with the tea videos, but I hope that some of you find this speech interesting. Thanks, bye. So Happy New Year and today we are going to um, go into the very deep and interesting subject of consciousness. This is um, obviously pretty broad um, and pretty deep um, and it's sort of a reflection of the reading that I've been doing over the past six months and I thought it was interesting and I thought I'd share it with you. For those of you who don't know, every New Year we try to do sort of a speech which hopefully is going to um, give you some ideas that you can bring into your year. So, I apologize if this gets a little bit techy, bear with me, okay? There's a bit of science in this, but um, I hope that it leaves you with some interesting conclusions. So first of all, is consciousness an illusion? Consciousness is the fundamental requirement for all scientific investigation. You can't do science without consciousness, and yet, to many scientists, it is considered an epiphenomenon or an illusion. Others say that the science of consciousness is impossible because science by nature needs to be objective and consciousness by nature is subjective. Although since all of our objective truths come from a subjective reality or conscious reality, doesn't that make them subjective actually in themselves? For many scientists, philosophers and spiritualists, consciousness is the most mysterious phenomenon in the universe and believe that by understanding consciousness we may unlock a fundamental understanding of the whole universe. So it's not just about us, it's also about everything. So let's start at the beginning. What is consciousness? According to the dictionary, it's the state of being aware of and responsive to one's surroundings. Very simplistic definition, I'm sure you'll agree. And everyone will have their own interpretations of what consciousness is, but we all know that we are conscious. And I think that most people would agree that consciousness and conscious experience is what gives a lot of value to our lives. Philosopher David Chalmers tried to separate the problem into the soft problem and the hard problem. The soft problem being the how. How does consciousness work? What are the areas in the brain that compute information? How is that computation happening in the brain? How do we categorize? How do we distinguish information? How do we focus attention? These are sort of functional mechanisms. This is the work that's being done, valuable work that's being done by neuroscientists to try to unlock um, the understanding of how our brain functions and how we bring uh, awareness into our brain through processing information. The hard problem is not the how, it's the what and the why. What creates the experience of those um, stimuli or information? Why do we have an experience of our identity? Why do we have an experience of color, of pleasure, pain, existence? We can understand the visual information from this flower is received by the brain and processed, but what gives us the experience of its pinkness, the 3D sense of its reverse, the evoked emotion of the flower itself? This is sometimes called qualia, which is a quality or property as perceived or experienced by a person, a perceptual experience beyond the physical information being received by the body. How would you describe the experience of red to a colorblind person? Can you imagine a blue strawberry? If you, if you can, then you are creating an experience that is, has no physical basis. Some people reject this idea of consciousness altogether. Others claim that experience is actually the only reality and everything else is illusion. So let's take a look at the spectrum of thought on consciousness and it is pretty divided. On the left, you have 
monism. Monism means basically believing in one singular truth, right? So you have the physicalists, the materialists, and the reductionists. Their basic premise is that matter is the precursor for life. Matter is what begins with it. Everything begins with matter. And consciousness is a sort of arising out of matter, and a lot of people think of it as an illusion that comes from matter, an epiphenomenon. So you can see matter is solid and consciousness is a sort of illusion. Then you've got the dualists. Dualists, Cartesian dualists, they believe that matter exists, so they believe in realism, that matter exists beyond us, matter will always exist, but that the mind or consciousness is actually something that's different. It's essentially a different substance, if you like. And so they believe both to be solid and true. And then you've got monism on the other side, the idealists, the non-dualists, people who believe in biocentrism, the anthropic principle, the idea that consciousness actually precedes matter, that consciousness is what's required for you to interpret matter, and actually that matter could itself be an illusion, and consciousness is all that matters in the universe, and so therefore you have matter being dotted out as an illusion. Generalizations about to follow, I apologize, but we have to generalize a little bit. Physicalists and materialists accept realism. Again, realism is the idea that the physical matter exists beyond us, beyond consciousness. It will exist even if we're not here. And rejects the idea of independent consciousness. Dualists accept realism and accept independent consciousness. Idealists reject realism and usually their idea of consciousness extends to the concept of universal consciousness or proto-consciousness. And it might start to move into theism and pantheism, the idea that there is a sort of universal consciousness that has um, created all of consciousness. In general, again, big generalizations, but in general, conventional science is on the left. Um, generally, non-religious, non-spiritual, non-mysticism type people, people who really believe that matter precedes everything, they tend to occupy this side. Um, again, apologies, but in general, a lot of Western religions and a lot of sort of general society, I think if you asked 100 people on the street, a lot of people feel that their mind and consciousness is a sort of separation from matter, but both exist. And then the idealists and non-dualists come from a lot of traditional uh, um, thoughts from pre-Socratic, some Christian philosophy, Chinese Neo-Confucianism, the Vedanta, uh, Buddhism, um, 19th century philosophers. There's a lot of people that believed, that believe in idealism or non-dualism. Most forms of idealism share the idea that conscious and subjective experience of something either creates an illusion of matter or the only way to understand the matter is through your consciousness and therefore by default you can't understand it in any other way other than through your consciousness. A lot of people in this field start to think of uh, consciousness as fundamental. So you have things in physics like gravity, like mass, like space like time that are fundamentals of the universe and so the question is is consciousness a fundamental of the universe is it something that is part of physics part of the um, underlying uh, physics of the universe it's like trying to find uh, trying to find value in a coin the value of the coin doesn't exist in the ingredients of the metal, at least nowadays it doesn't. It exists around all the laws around it, this system that we understand that gives the coin value. And so therefore thinking of trying to find consciousness in the brain is similar to the idealist point of view as trying to find um, value in the ingredients of a coin. So idealism can consider consciousness as another fundamental of physics, like space or time, or as I said before, it can be seen as one true consciousness that some people may refer to as God or, or have some sort of religious aspect to. Or in the case of panpsychism, which is a very specific branch, they believe that consciousness is in everything, including non-living things. So every single particle in the universe has some element of consciousness, and it's just about how complex that consciousness is in terms of manifesting itself. Let's look at some of the evidence for the materialists 
point of view. So materialists believe that the problem of consciousness is not a real problem at all, but simply a matter of needing to understand more about how the brain works. The theory is that as neuroscientists understand the greater detail of how we process information, we will come to naturally understand that the percep perception of consciousness is a result of computation, high-level computation in the brain, which gives grander and richer experience. In essence, materialists believe that the physical world provides activity in our neurons, which when computed by our brains, create an experience that we mistakenly perceive as consciousness. Essentially, they believe that we act non-consciously and then trick ourselves into thinking that we are conscious. As biologist Huxley says, we are merely helpless spectators. This relates to the idea of a deterministic universe where everything is already decided for you and you have no free will at all. So, a professional tennis player receiving the uh, serve of another very fast serving tennis player theoretically doesn't have enough time to consciously see the ball arrive, move the body, adjust the racket, swing and return the serve. And so this is considered as evidence that we act non-consciously. But if you speak to a tennis player, they will say that they saw it, that they saw the ball, that they reacted to it. And so the materialist point of view is that we're creating false memories, that we act non-consciously and then we sort of create a false memory as if, oh yeah, we did actually do that consciously. So are we acting non-consciously? One experiment that seems to point to non-conscious action is an exper experiment that was done by Libet. It was a finger experiment. So if you hold out your hand, this was the experiment, and I say, whenever you want, you can just flick your finger. You choose, total free will, take as long as you want, but there's a little dot going around a clock here. Make sure you remember when you decided to do it, and then tell us when you decided to do it. And they measured the um, electrical um, conductance going through to the brain, and they found that the signal, the readiness potential, the signal to, to start the stimulation for movement, actually supposedly happens up to half a second before you consciously make the decision, theoretically. I, I find this very flawed, this idea of thinking about when you're going to do it, that might potentially affect things, and there's a lot of controversy about this experiment, but a lot of people, especially in the materialist uh, side of, of consciousness thinking, point to this as an idea, that w as, a, as proof that we may be acting non-consciously and then thinking and fooling ourselves that we actually act consciously. There's also something called the color phi experiment, which is simply a very complicated way of saying animation. If you put a red dot on the left and then immediately after it disappears, you put another red dot on the right, you will have the illusion that there's a line. You'll have an illusion of movement between the two spaces, even if it doesn't exist. So this is the basis of all filmmaking. This is the basis of all animation. If, however, you suddenly change the right-hand dot color to green, then the uh, people who are having these experiments done on them claim that they see the color change halfway through. Now, this is not possible, right? Because they've only seen it once it's reached its end point, that green. And therefore, again, scientists use this as evidence to say that we are sort of creating false memories, that we, we, we think we saw it, but we didn't. And we are just sort of going back in time and sort of changing our memory. So we're implanting false memories in our head. So that's the standard materialist view. The brain retrospectively creates content to give you an illusion of conscious control and you falsely remember yourself as acting consciously. Interestingly, Libet's experiment, he did not claim that that meant we didn't have free will. He called it free won't. Apparently, we are constantly wanting to do these things, but we have the ability to stop ourselves. But we don't have free will. We don't act consciously. Let's look at the other side of the spectrum, idealism, the idea that uh, consciousness is the precursor for all matter. One um, area, because you may think that this is pretty far out, it's just sort of in the realm of, the, of the, the, those um, old traditions, but actually there's a lot of science which is supporting this idea. One, you don't have to read all that by the way, 
One is the Goldilocks universe or the fine-tuned universe. What's interesting is that to many scientists, the universe is baffling because of the fact that it seems like it has been made perfectly to create life. We're talking about the most minute changes to at least dozens, some people say up to a hundred different um, fundamental values, constants in physics. If they were slightly different, life couldn't exist. Here are just a few. Again, this is controversial. Some people will argue with this, but a lot of people um, will agree that our universe is very fine-tuned for life. There's one constant called the cosmological constant, which Einstein famously put into his equations and then took out, and he, he said it was his biggest blunder to, to put it in, but it actually has gone back in. It's a, it's a tiny, tiny figure. We're talking a zero with 122 zeros and then a one at the end, right? So we're talking about tiny, 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 tiny figure, and yet a lot of scientists believe that without this cosmological constant, which is a sort of anti-gravity, it helps the universe to continue to expand, life couldn't exist. And that's one of the ones that baffles a lot of scientists. As um, Robert Lanza says in his book, Beyond Biocentrism, the problem is our universe has an exquisite set of properties that are Goldilocks perfect for life to exist. We live in an extraordinarily fine-tuned cosmos. It's a place where any random tweaking that conjured even slightly different parameters in hundreds of independent ways would not do the job of allowing any kind of life to arise. So that's one of, one of the, 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 the areas that idealists point to that says, you know, consciousness has to be part of the design of the universe. <clears throat> Critics of the fine-tuned universe claim that we are suffering from what is called survivor bias. And that means that, yes, maybe the universe is very fine-tuned for life, but we just happen to be living in that one universe. And there were millions of universes before. So we are just sort of going, well, therefore it must be by design. But in fact, we just were the lucky ones. So that's one of the criticisms, is that we're suffering from survivor bias. It's kind of akin to you seeing, say, 10 or 100 uh, dice rolled and they all land on six, and you thinking, well, the dice must be weighted. But in fact, you just happen to witness that one out of millions of dice rolls. That's the sort of argument that's being used against this theory of the fine-tuned universe, as well as criticisms that they don't believe it is fine-tuned. Another area that the idealists point to, which is very difficult for a lot of people to get their head around is the idea that matter requires consciousness, that there is no realism, that matter doesn't exist or it can't be interpreted or understood in any way without consciousness. In the case of subjective idealism, they genuinely believe that matter does not exist and is all in our heads, that it's all in our brains or all in our consciousness, I should say. So the peekaboo game that's played by babies is a, very, uh, is a very clever one, actually. The baby is amused, surprised, and baffled by the idea that when you take your hands away, you've suddenly popped into existence. And then when you cover their eyes, you disappear. And you can play that game again and again and again. And as we grow older, we sort of learn to assume that that person is still there. And so we start to get ingrained into this idea of realism that Matter is out there independent of consciousness. Is that true? Your perception of the physical world is created by receiving signals and then being processed by your body according to your experience. To all of you, the color of my suit is orange, but is my suit actually orange? The answer is no. It is made of atoms with electrons which are forever dancing. When light from nearby light sources reaches those electrons, they rise to a higher level of activity, and when they fall back, they give off information. And that information passes into your eyes and is interpreted as orange. And why don't we see the orange color actually moving across the room if it actually exists? Because the actual orange does not exist at all. Our eyes and brains are interpreting invisible information and creating a conscious experience of orange which does not actually exist outside of your consciousness. There is more emptiness in the universe than anything else. Do you want to know the percentage of matter in the universe? Apparently, that's the latest estimate. That's how much actual matter exists in the universe, which is pretty mind-blowing. <laughs> 
And if you think that that matter itself is not filled with emptiness, then you'd be wrong. In fact, relative to size, if you take the nucleus of, a, of an atom and you compare it to the sun, there's the same amount of emptiness as would be in the solar system. That means that if you took all the emptiness out of all the atoms on Earth, it would shrink down to something like the size of a large marble. Imagine the Earth. That's how much emptiness exists. So everything that appears to you to be solid is actually mostly empty. Touch something and you're not actually touching it at all. Instead, the electrons on the outermost atoms of your skin are dancing with the electrons on the, on the atoms of the object you are touching and they're competing for energy states. If it were not for this competition, this, this, uh, this repulsion that comes from this competition where there's not enough space, you would fall through these chairs and fall through the earth. You're so empty. <laughs> It makes you wonder why we don't spend more time studying emptiness and the power of emptiness, but that's a whole other discussion. It's something that certainly a lot of traditional thinking goes into, the power of emptiness. How does emptiness, this 99.9999999% of everything is empty, how does that affect us and why are we not studying it more? Everything that you perceive to be real in the external world is actually not like that at all outside of your consciousness. The truth is, to idealists, that we live in a universe of information and particles and we form our reality of the universe in our conscious experience. But hold on, what about the crazy idea these subjective materialists, uh, idealists have that, that particles don't actually exist in a place unless they are observed or measured. This is when we start to move into quantum mechanics and this is where scientists, materialists get very upset because non-formal trained people like me talking about quantum mechanics is instantly considered woo-woo, pseudoscience, unscientific because apparently I'm not allowed to talk about it because I'll never understand it unless I study it properly. Well, I mean this is a classic kind of cartoon, I'll read it but dogs can observe the world, which means that according to quantum mechanics, they must have souls. And the caption is, pro tip, you can safely ignore any sentence that, that includes the phrase according to quantum mechanics. And I kind of understand where they're coming from. Quantum mechanics is mind-bending, it's bizarre, it's crazy. As Niels Bohr, one of the main physicists to contribute to quantum theory says, anyone who's not shocked by quantum theory has not understood it yet. Quantum theory is nuts, and therefore a lot of people will just sort of blindly throw around quantum theory, quantum mechanics to explain away everything. So I get the frustration, absolutely. However, I also believe that there's tribalism on both sides. And I believe that the uh, materialists and the physicalists, um, they have to also be conscious of the fact that they can't just keep this to themselves to, in order to sort of justify, in order to justify their belief system, that science should truly be open, and that means allowing everybody to explore these ideas and sure, question them, argue, discuss. But these kind of buzzwords of immediately anyone who mentions quantum mechanics is woo or pseudoscience, I think, is really, really unhelpful um, and not something that actually contributes to true science at all. So I'm going to give you a basic idea of quantum mechanics. This is where I said be careful. It's going to get a little bit scientific, but hopefully you follow. Um, and I'm going to say that this is a simplistic version because we're not you know, sitting in a classroom. So I'm going to kind of make some, some uh, simplification, but I hope that um, anybody who's out there watching who understands quantum mechanics can see that I haven't done it a disservice. You may have probably heard of the double slit experiment, but if you haven't, I will explain it to you. So if you pass light and it hits a couple of slits, 
it naturally forms ripples because we know that light can act as waves, right? And so those ripples will interact with each other, the troughs will interact with each other, the peaks will interact with each other, and you'll get what is called an interference pattern, where you start to see areas where there's ampli uh, an amplification of the light and areas where there's darker areas, yeah? So light acting as a wave interacting with each other like this, creates this interference pattern. And so the interference pattern is a symbol and it shows you that something is acting as a wave. If you fire a single electron or a single photon, let's stick with photons for the time being, but you can do this with pretty much any particle. If you fire one at a time, then it will pass through these slits and it will land on the screen in full intensity. No, no big surprise, but when you keep firing, so keep firing one at a time, one at a time, what you start to see, what you would imagine you would see, is a clump pattern where you would see essentially two slits that replicate pretty much the light going through each slit. But in fact, what you see is an interference pattern, which is totally bizarre because an interference pattern means that it's acting as a wave. And if it's being fired at one particle at a time, how is it being acting as a wave? And how is it interacting with itself to create this? So it's creating this interference pattern. And this is what scientists call superposition. It means that the particle, in essence, before it's detected over here, is sort of going through both none and one at a time. So it's acting as a wave. It's going through it completely. And that is called the wave function. So when people in quantum mechanics talk about a wave function, it simply is acting as a wave, a particle acting as a wave. And it can only do that by being in multiple places at the same time, by having superposition. When you detect it, it becomes fixed. It has, a, it has a, an intensity and it has a location. And this scientists call the collapsing of the wave function. So you've got superposition, you've got the wave function, and then when it's forced to assume a fixed position, that's called collapsing of the wave function. Now, what's weird is, if you try to measure which one of these slits the electron or the photon goes through, so you put a little detector here or you put a detector there, anywhere, you put a de detector anywhere, then the particle seems to act as if it knows it's being detected. And instead of the interference pattern, you get the standard clump pattern. So, this happens no matter how you try to measure, it's called the which way information, which way it went through, left or right. So that's the terminology. So if you hear me talk about which way information, that's what it means. No matter how you try to detect it. Now, obviously, a lot of scientists say, yeah, but when we're detecting it, we're firing light at it and we're trying to look for it. And that for it, therefore, it's changing it physically. It's somehow changing it. And that's what causes it to collapse its wave function. Experiment after experiment after experiment to try to take away all of the factors that may influence the uh, particle have been done, even to the point where they've They've, they've uh, done the experiment and they've got the information and they have a scrambling machine. If they turn the scrambling machine on, then suddenly it becomes a wave function again because the particle knows, ah, you don't know which way I went through. As soon as you turn the scrambling information, uh, a machine off, then suddenly the clump pattern appears. Some scientists say, as I said, that the act of measuring is what causes this. However, no matter what experiments we do, if we try to detect the which way information, then the pattern switches. We can even leave all of the detection apparatus in place exactly as it was and just have the scrambling device and it still has the same effect. The Copenhagen interpretation of this, Niels Bohr and his ilk, claim that when we measure something, we are forcing an undetermined, undefined world to assume an experimental value. We are not measuring the world, we are creating it very idealistic in its uh, approach here. And apparently Einstein and Bohr had lots of arguments about this, and one of the arguments was, Einstein said, do you really believe that the moon doesn't exist if we're not looking at it? And Niels Bohr said that, that any answer is an infallible conjecture, which means it cannot be proved or disproved. There's no way of us knowing that. It's just impossible. There are, there's another popular interpretation of this, and that is the many worlds theory. The many worlds theory is that the waveform doesn't actually collapse and that you happen to be just part of this universal waveform and you happen to see 
it act in that way. In other words, you are part of the uh, waveform and every single decision, every single thing that happens in our lives or in the world creates a parallel universe, creates another world. In other words, there's an almost infinite number of worlds out there and you happen to feel like it's fixed, but you're just traveling along in that one. Nice cartoon here, I'll read it to you. Father says to daughter, Eve, eat your lima beans. And she says, I did, but by choosing to eat my lima beans, I created a parallel universe where I chose not to eat them, which is the universe we happen to exist in. <laughs> <laughs> she says, so don't get mad at me because of the inescapable consequences of free will. Apparent, and then she's asked, did it work? And she says, apparently there's a parallel universe where I chose not to clean the toilet. <laughs> so this is the multiple worlds theory, the idea that we are part of a universal wave function and that anything that could happen has happened. Now, materialists will say, no, stop. You're getting into woo, you're getting into pseudoscience. The quantum world cannot affect the classical world. Schrodinger's cat, I'm not going to get into it, but was, a, was an example of that, saying, no, you can't combine the two. You can't conflate the quantum world with the macro world or the classical world. Because as soon as you go above quantum size, then you cause what's called decoherence, and that causes a collapse of the wave function. So you don't need observation. You don't need measurement. It will just collapse just by the nature of size. In theoretical physics, however, there is no reason why that could be true, why that is true, and they have shown quantum behavior in molecules made up of over 100 atoms. Now, that's not that big, but in theoretical physics, they, they say that there's no theoretical size limit. And since all matter is made up of these quantum particles, then how can these mechanics not be affecting the, the, the macro world in some way? would be a question that I think is an interesting question to ask. But things get even weirder. In quantum mechanics, there's something called quantum entanglement. So if you imagine splitting a proton through a crystal, the result is two protons that are entangled. And that means that if you, if you collapse the wave function in one of them, it will automatically and instantaneously collapse the wave function in the other. So the moment you measure one, the other one knows, ah, my partner's been measured, I'm going to collapse as well. And this can happen over any distance. We can talk about millions of kilometers, and it happens instantaneously. Quantum entanglement has been performed on particles up to the size of diamonds. As I said, this change can happen over any distance. This is called non-locality. The idea that space actually doesn't effect doesn't you don't need space to be the definer of whether or not you can affect something so quantum entanglement seems to destroy the relevance of space in the interaction between certain things as i said that the change happens instantaneously so it seems to also take away the relevancy of time the next slide is going to scare you but don't worry you don't have to understand it so all i'm going to show you here is this this is called the quantum eraser experiment. This is where things get super freaky. Okay, so you're gonna do the double slit experiment again, but after the double slit, you put it through one of these crystals. So it splits the photon into photon A and photon B. So they're entangled pairs. They go off in separate directions, okay? This is where you're seeing the interference pattern or the clump pattern, this detector here, okay? Now, if we measure the entangled twin, then this turns into a clump pattern. If we don't measure it, then it is an interference pattern. So exactly the same as before, right? However, if we move these further away so that this photon hits that screen before we can measure it, a very interesting thing happens. When we measure it, the particle, the entangled particle, its pair, turns into a clump pattern. When we don't, it turns into an inter interference parent pattern. It's as if this particle knows the future, knows what is going to happen. Or that this particle sends back information in time and says, hey, let's go back in time, you need to go clump or you need to go into, into the interference pattern because I've been detected. This is called retrocausality. 
and is a bit mind-blowing because essentially it means that information is somehow passing through time. <coughs> Either that there's a premonition, that this particle knows what's going to happen, or that the particle in the future is somehow affecting the past. Physicists are trying to repeat this sort of experiment over large distances, and they're trying to repeat the double slit experiment over large distances. How large? There, there's a theoretical thought process, a thought experiment of trying to measure quasars going around, so quasars, light going around galaxies. So light that are billions of years old. Can we somehow affect, by measuring and observ observing, can we affect the behavior of light that's billions of years old? John Wheeler, who created this thought experiment, says in his conclusions, no phenomenon is a phenomenon until it is an observed phenomenon. And the past has no existence except as recorded in the present. And the universe does not exist out there independent of all acts of observation. Again, sounds pretty idealist in terms of its approach. Again, a lot of controversy about this. I already know this is going to go up on YouTube and there's going to be a million comments, so I'm prepared, okay? So, does time move in two directions? If retrocausality is true, then while we live in a universe where we experience time in a forward motion, and we assume that the future is blank, and caused by our actions preceding it, time actually could be considered potentially to be a two-way street with information passing both ways. Your present state, where you are now, is a result of causality, preceding events, and retro-causality, succeeding event events. Decisions and changes that you make in the present will ripple forwards in time and ripple backwards in time. So you'll be affecting your future and affecting your past. Some physicists say, I love this quote, every decision that you make will ripple back and alter the beginning of the universe. Your decisions today are affected by ripples from the past and from the future. Is there any evidence for this? There's a fair amount of evidence for gut instinct, pre-sentiment, pre-cognition. There were studies done on commuter train crashes by a, a, a scientist or a, a, um, a I guess a statistician called W.E. Cox in the 1950s looking at commuter train crashes and he found that the incidence of people not turning up and not boarding those trains when there was crashes were very very high, statistically high, with odds of 1 in 25. The 9-11 planes were very under-occupied compared to average. And tests that are done in, uh, um, experiments that are done seem to show that you react before things. So if you uh, wire somebody up, so they've got a skin conductance test, so where they're wiring for reactions, and you are about to play a very loud noise or, play, or show them a very disturbing image, studies have shown that you, you show, your physical body shows a reaction before the sound is played, before the image is shown to you. Again, an idea of precognition, gut instinct, whatever you want to call it, sounds like something that people sort of say in passing, but actually when you look at quantum uh, retrocausality, there may be some truth in it. So I've intentionally gone a little deeper into quantum mechanics for a few reasons. Firstly, I think it's very interesting. Um, and it, it support, seems to support some elements of the idealist, this traditional view of consciousness, this traditional, you know, this Buddhist uh, Vedanta, the uh, Neo-Confucianism, all of this, this idea that con consciousness is either a precursor for matter or is essential for matter um, to exist. So, some conclusions. Particles will act in superposition as waves of probability until measured in some way. Now some people say if you observe it, it changes. It's actually the measurement, but is there a big difference between that? The act of observing or measuring affects the behavior of particles in ways that we do not truly understand. And quantum theory shows that some actions seem to transcend time, causality, and space, locality. This starts to move into the whole area of free will again, but that's the subject of another discussion. <laughs>
There is some science, and a couple of scientists, Roger Penrose, a really great mathematician, one of the greatest mathematicians, um, and um, an anesthesiologist called Stuart Hameroff. They have come up with this concept of quantum consciousness. And if you hashtag quantum consciousness, you'll see a lot of arguments about this online. So the idea is that they believe that there are, we have brains, we have neurons, but inside the neurons are tiny structures called microtubules, and these exist throughout your body. And these microtubules are so small that this sort of quantum weirdness can happen within them. And that there's a protein called tubulin that can act in superposition. It can act in wave function. And it's the collapse of the wave function that causes consciousness. He's an anesthesiologist, so he's believing that the, 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 the work that he's doing is actually shutting down the action of the quantum processing in your brain. And that's how you are made unconscious for um, surgery and things like that. According to these authors, and this is a very controversial, this collapsing of the wave function is caused by ripples in space-time geometry, which they call proto-consciousness, very similar to the idea of universal consciousness. Um, and they suggest even that within this proto-consciousness, there may be platonic values embedded within it. So ideas of aesthetic, ideas of ethics, ideas of mathematics are embedded within this space-time ripple which cause this sort of collapsing of the wave function in your microtubules and that's what leads to consciousness. So this is one theory in terms of quantum consciousness and they believe that that tennis player what's happening is that you do act consciously and then you send back information in time to tell your body how to react. So this idea of you reacting non-consciously is somehow explained through the retrocausality of quantum physics. I bet you didn't think you would understand those words about half an hour ago, <laughs> but you do hopefully now. So the idea is that backwards information, this comes direct from their papers. <laughs> it's, it's always funny when you start see, seeing scientific papers talking about time travel, but it's fun. So backwards causality, or retrocausality is actually, so you're acting consciously and then you're sending information back in time. That's one potential theory. Another um, theory, which I'm not gonna get into too much, but I think it's worth mentioning. Stuart Hameroff, one of the authors, believes that this idea of the selfish gene that somehow our DNA wants to replicate, just, just because it does, is absurd to him. And he thinks that even the most simple life forms have these microtubules. And so there will always be some element of a rising of consciousness in these simple living things. And that arising of consciousness, that gives them a sort of pleasure. He calls it the, the quantum pleasure principle. The idea that that is what drives even the most seemingly simple organisms to want to reproduce and not the selfish gene, according to Dawkins, of course. Finally, it's interesting to note that throughout your body there are microtubules and Stuart Hameroff has also written a paper claiming or suggesting that potentially the idea of qi or the idea of, in Chinese medicine, qi, but that every tradition has um, similar concepts, is actually um, moving through these microtubules or arises through these microtubules through your body. And that is maybe how acupuncture um, uh, is involved in um, healing. So how do we wrap this all up? Consciousness studies are bewildering and complex to say the least. It makes us question everything about reality. Believe me, I've been sitting scratching my head for the past six months trying to understand it. I think that they're scary to some and exciting to others, but ultimately the understanding of consciousness is the most important scientific study, in my opinion, because consciousness houses the entirety of all understanding. Quantum entanglement may show us that everything may be all interconnected in ways that transcend space and time. And many idealists would say that everything is an expression of one consciousness, one universal consciousness manifesting itself in supposedly individual life forms in the same way as rising waves express the ocean and then disappear back into the ocean. When we, when we die, we seemingly, our seemingly independent consciousness reveals itself 
to be part of one consciousness, immortal and timeless. And the next time that you stare up at the stars and feel awe and feel insignificant, then remember that according to some physicists, you are communicating with them beyond time and space. They are reacting to your gaze and may only exist because of your observations. Pretty wild one, I know, but that's according to some people. The universe may exist inside you just as much as you exist inside the universe. And that is one of the biggest wonders for me of existence. Happy New Year. Cheers, everybody.